Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. It's time to get all your Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here are your hosts, Mark Nubo and Dave Tree. That's not true. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. How are you? And how are you? Hang on a second. I know it's not pantomime season yet, but how are you? That's as British as it gets. That's great. This is, this is the guy that taught me how to work a crowd. <laughs> They're all going to get up and leave in a minute. <laughs> so how's tricks? Are you enjoying... Uh, first, a very British question. Yes. Are you enjoying the muggy weather? The muggy weather, um, no, I hate it. <laughs> Let's get back to the freezing cold. Yeah, yeah. Much prefer that. Yeah. More hot than Tatooine. Absolutely. So you, you edited The Insider for, was it about 10 years? 10 long years, <laughs> yes. 10 long years. What, where was Star Wars when you took over the magazine? In terms of where in the timeline of, of what was going on? So in what was going on, we had just, let's see, we just had um, Revenge of the Sith. So, which, as everyone knows, um, back then was the last Star Wars movie, um, or so we were told. And then, of course, things change. Um, and then we were gearing up for the Clone Wars. So, are there any Clone Wars fans here? Good. Yeah, enthusiastic crowd. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was the era of the Clone Wars. Star Wars on TV. George, I remember vividly George Lucas saying... Uh, there's no future of Star Wars in cinema, the future is on TV. And he was, I guess he was half right. It's funny, I used to run a website called Lightsaber back in the day. I actually interviewed you on Lightsaber back in I the remember. day. I remember. And all the interviews that I did, sort of 2006, 7, 8, every question, are you looking forward to being in the Star Wars TV show? What character do you think you'll play in the Star Wars TV show? You kind of forget how prevalent it was back then. Yeah, absolutely. It was, um, I remember seeing posters and... Uh, advert saying Star Wars coming to TVs in 2009 I think it was Star Wars Underworld and of course the t that time's gone and it never happened and, but Star Wars is obviously now they're gearing up to do some Star Wars TV, finally. Finally, long overdue. Yeah. So in your role uh, explain, and I know no two days are ever the same but give me a <laughs> rough a rough idea of what a day in the life for you would be, time constraints, print deadlines, all that sort of stuff Oh, the deadlines. The deadlines are horrible. Um, the, the, what can I say? It's a case of, um, with, you're making a magazine, you're always trying to catch up. You're never ahead of yourself, especially in Star Wars, because there's so many secrets um, and so many things that, you know, you're in a privileged position that you know about, but then, you know, when you're putting stuff together, you're not sure whether everyone else knows about them. So... The only person back then that I could actually tell anything to was my mum because she simply doesn't care about Star Wars. <laughs> and what was the relationship? I mean, this is pre-Disney era, so it's a different, a different time. Another galaxy, another time. Uh, when you were dealing with Lucasfilm, for example, that you get the information. You're a print magazine, so there's, there's different, con different things there, different things in play, time scales. How, would, how did that work then? I know it, things changed as things moved on, but how did things work then? What would generally happen is that when we put the magazine to press and send it to print, the day after that, there would be a massive Star Wars announcement that we didn't know about. So we'd be all in tears and thinking, well, we're going to have to put it in the next issue, which is then a month or two months later, and people are going to think, well, these guys aren't really <laughs> equipped to uh, deal with Star Wars because they don't know what's going on. Um, that does happen, but generally we were sort of quite on the ball. We had a qu good relationship with the Star Wars sort of PR team. They sort of tipped us off as to what was happening. I remember Dave Filoni from the Clone Wars saying, um, telling me the, uh, the sort of the fate of Ahsoka at the end of the Clone Wars, and it was absolutely gripping because his, his telling of it down the phone line all the way from San Francisco was, was just as good um, as the, uh, the animated show. Uh, his enthusiasm and sort of, and he kept saying, are you sure you want to know this? And I said, well, I have to, it's my job. 
So, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's one of those things. There was a lot going on in Star Wars back in 2008, obviously, but that ramped up significantly. Once we got to the Disney era and then beyond with, with what's certainly now, how, how does that juggle work in terms of, you've just said it, you, know, you want to be as on the pulse as you possibly can be, you go to print on a Wednesday and then Lucasfilm puts a press release out on a Thursday. You know, how, do you, how do you manage those two things? And also, as, a, as a, an addition to that question, was there ever the temptation for Insider to have a supplemental website that could be on the pulse, or was that always going to be left to StarWars.com? Um, yeah, it, uh, well, having a website is um, tricky because obviously you're hiring more people than... Uh, frankly, I'm not sure we could do as good job as Fantha Tracks in the website department. Uh, there we are. Thank you. <laughs> you owe me one. <laughs> um, but uh, sorry, what was the first part of the question? I can't remember now. Okay, well, it's um, a good question. How, how do you stay on oh. top of it? How do you stay on top of those breaking news stories? Oh, you don't. You, there's no way you can stay on top of them. You, you just beg for print dates to be put back. Um, you know, everything is down down the line. It, it, it's a series of last-minute escapes and last minute, you know, it's, if it's printing on the Wednesday, can it print on the Wednesday evening? Um, could it possibly print on the Thursday morning? I was um, going to say, is there ever any wriggle room? No. No, it's there isn't. There isn't. And also, if you do that, it does make the best magazine you can possibly do. Because if, if you finish the magazine and put it to print really early, <laughs> this is my excuse anyway, if you do it really early... Um, you're not going to get those last-minute no. bits of information that you would get nearer to the release date of the film because um, the attitude we always take with the magazine is the film does come first. You know, there'd be nothing worse than us spoiling something from the movie and, you know, you guys all going to see the movie and going, oh, well, I know that was going to happen because it was in Star Wars Insider. You know, it, it's, it's the equivalent of someone telling a really funny joke and somebody comes in at the last minute and yells the punchline before the teller gets a chance to finish the joke. It's not very fair at all. Hello. Hello. Pitch invasion. Sorry. Hello. You're right. <laughs> You're right. Okay. Did, that, did yes. that ever happen? Did anything ever sneak through that shouldn't? Yeah, I can't tell you what, though. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, oh, anything sneak through that shouldn't? Yes, I think we, at one point on the Clone Wars, um, there was a costume change for Ahsoka. Yeah. And we printed a picture that was, I mean, we thought it was a costume change just for one episode or something, and it, it turned out to be her, her sort of aging up a few years, and uh, it was what, about season three or four, yeah, I it think was it was. about season three, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and that, that kind of went much. in, and... It came back and we suddenly thought, oh no, we're going to get, you know, will anyone notice? And my editor, my managing editor, I should say, said, there's no way anyone's going to notice that, you know, and it, like Star Wars fans aren't super observant and notice all this stuff. <laughs> and of course, we got hundreds and hundreds of letters of going, what's the deal with that picture of Ahsoka and that costume? So um, we learned a lesson there and we double checked everything <laughs> going forwards. What was the most, uh, uh, personally, because I mean, you were writing for The Insider before you were editing it as well, so what was the most interesting or the most fulfilling interview or article that you did during your tenure on the magazine? Oh, the, um, the, the most interesting one was, I mean, the interviews are always fun to do. Um, probably the, our, when I had a transatlantic call with Mark Hamill, uh, three o'clock in the morning, our time, um, chatting away um, which he did the first part of the interview in the voice of the Joker which was really odd um, you know it, it was me and my flat in South Croydon uh, talking to the Joker who then suddenly starts talking like Luke Skywalker that was probably the most surreal um, moment I think um, and also Mark, when Mark Hamill does an interview because he's told a lot of these stories many times he will, if he tells a story that he thinks is new he'll end the anecdote and say I don't think I've told anyone that story before and you think how have you not told the story of you being on your honeymoon and seeing somebody with a Darth Vader mask water skiing 
you know, down the beach in Antigua. You know, it's, it's very strange. But, uh, but yeah, talking to Luke Skywalker was a, that's a biggie, I think. Now, these days, you work on the magazine specials, the insider specials. So tell us a little bit about that. What, what are they? Why would they be of interest to people beyond regular insider readers or people that don't read magazine or read the insider? Well, now I don't know. I'm looking out at the audience here and I can see a, a lot of very young people. So you probably can't remember um, the days in the 80s maybe where you used to go to the cinema and they would sell magazines and brochures in the cinema of the movies you were going to see. And they'd have these collect... Can anyone rem remember those when we're going to... Yeah, see, very young, very young. Oh, no, don't re just popcorn. Um, and it, it's, in my mind, it's that sort of thing. It's like a, a, a souvenir of the movie, almost like, um, like a sort of DVD special feature. Um, so it's almost in, in that sort of idea and that kind of uh, thing, which I, I... I mean, we do Star Wars, we do Marvel, we do Pixar... Um, and they seem to be very popular. I think people do like that sort of tangible su souvenir of the movies they see. I'd never thought of it in that terms because because back in the day, Star Wars Empire and Jedi, you know, they all had those movie mags. I think Mar Marvel did the, the Star Wars one. And, you know, to, to think of it in those terms is, is quite cool. I've not, I've not considered it in that way. Yeah, and we, we always look at them and say, well, if you were a seven-year-old kid, would you really like to have this for Christmas or... Would you like this? I mean, the strange thing is, is we did, um, oh, we did uh, Rogue One and The Last Jedi, and I don't think they did making of books for those movies. So no, I, um, no, so they we, did the art of books, but I don't think they've done. They weren't ma any making of books. So these were almost like the making of those movies. You know, I mean, not quite sort of Jonathan Rinsler level, no. but um, nevertheless, hopefully, nice souvenirs. And again, that's under the property where you, you've, you're ahead of the curve and the print deadline is a completely different... It's not a monthly, it's not a six weeks. You're, you're working at that much farther out. So are you, you basically writing in a locked cupboard? Yeah, I mean, Rogue One, the Rogue One um, magazine slash hardcover we did, um, I remember there were lots of screaming, lots of crying. Um, by the time we we sort of finished doing that we had felt that we'd been up against Darth Vader trying to get it was like the scene where he's trying to get they're trying to get the rebel plans out and just get this thing to print get it to print you know well, that's a good point isn't it because fans joke that you know Rogue One's the first Star Wars film to be released they released the DVD extras before the film came out because everything that's in the trailer is not in the film so you must have I'm assuming I'm making assumptions you must have written that magazine to a point and then things change and you refresh and or how did it work um, that's where the approvals process comes in because everything we do is approved by Lucasfilm. So we send it to Lucasfilm. They look at it. If there's stuff they want to change, we'll change it. You know, um, and sometimes there are, you know, you get notes back saying, with a line through and say, change this, take this picture. And what's reading between the lines? What's generally happened is that scene's been deleted from the film, and and so you you've you've got. <laughs> you've got a picture of something from the film which is generally watermarked, so it's got my name stamped through it, which is, again, terrifying. If you ever want to know sheer fear, it's having sort of uh, embargoed material with your name stamped on it, um, praying it doesn't end up on uh, the <laughs> internet, which it hasn't so far. Luckily. Well, that's good, that's good. Hey, I'm Matthew Reinhardt. Hi, I'm Kevin Wilson. And we're on Phantom Tracks. Now, I will never be the editor of the Star Wars Insider. You have been. How did you get to that point? What... What, what, what pathway did you take to, to get to that? And as a fan as well, it must have been a huge, huge moment for you. Well, I, st I started at Titan Magazines working on a, a magazine called Dreamwatch. Um, and within two weeks of me working on it, the magazine folded. And so, I used um, to get that magazine. I used yeah, to I know, that sorry. It was, it was all my fault. It was you, was it? Um, and so the managing editor said, do you like Star Wars? Um, and the question I think anyone would answer to that, uh, you know, sorry, the answer anyone would give to that question is, surely, yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. And if there's a job on the Star Wars magazine, I'll take it. So, um, so I took it, and sort of uh, the rest is history. But I ended up doing Indiana Jones magazine as well for a while. Which yeah, I is, remember that. Uh, yeah. You remember that? Oh, yeah, okay. I remember that. One person remembers it. That's really good. All five issues. It was wonderful. <laughs> So these days, as, as well as doing uh, the Star Wars specials, what other work are you doing for Titan? 
Um, well, there's the Marvel specials, all the Marvel movies. Um, we're working on some top secret projects at the moment, which you can probably guess what they are. Um, we're doing Pixar, so we're doing the likes of um, Frozen 2. Um, we've just done Toy Story 4, and we're, we're, we're aiming those at a slightly older audience because... Now, this, is, this is, makes me feel very old, but the first Toy Story uh, is, is kind of about 25 years old now, isn't 95, it, Mark? 95, 95. Yeah. So, um, so we're kind of aiming it for a slightly older audience, people that have uh, kind of followed those since they were little. And That's interesting because you always assume you see a, a different magazine publishers do the kids' Toy Story magazines, but there's such a huge process... A production process in making them come to fruition. It's it's cool that you do, you are pitching that at an older audience. Yeah, yeah, and I th but I think there's so much interesting stuff in that, like Easter eggs, you know, in the in the in the Pixar movies. You know, everyone's kind of spots little in jokes and things, which I think kids aren't necessarily interested in. They just like you know the action between you know the the characters and the adventures and things, but like you know to have a nice list of all those Easter eggs, I think is quite good fun. I think when we were kids. I don't know, kids read differently these days, but like you say, we got the same magazines that all the grown-ups got as youngsters. So as kids, we were w w that first generation that would know, not just know who the director was, but you know John Dykstra, you'd know, you know, you'd, all different names would come to you as kids, and I think that's probably carried on throughout the years with other movies, but never to any extent like Star Wars, quite like Star Wars. Well, the thing is as well, it's um, Star Wars, I've... I <laughs> It's amazing the things that stick in your mind. I remember being really fascinated with what fatigues are, as in best bin fatigues, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. And it, yeah. it's sort of looking up and saying, "What? The, what's what are fatigues? <laughs> what's a custodian? Yeah, you know, stuff like that." Yeah. It's so yeah, Star Wars taught me to read. Question: You've just made me think of something. Executor or executor? I know what the Lucasfilm policy on it is, but. Executor. Yeah. Yeah, because executor. Execute. Executor sounds like I'm you're dealing with a will or something. Yeah. Executor is, is going to kill you. AT, AT or AT AT? Oh, it's AT AT. No, it's yeah. AT AT. It's yeah. AT AT. Yeah, definitely. All, the, all AT -AT. this pushback, I just, I just, I don't get it. I'll let you into a little secret. And I'm going to get this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you into a little secret. George Lucas pronounces. Bosk in a totally different way to the rest of the world, but he has to be right because he's George Lucas. <laughs> I think he calls it Boesk. Why not? Why not? Why Absolutely. Not? Absolutely. <laughs> well, look, should we do some? Let's do that. Let's do it. Let's do that. Well, look, um, I've got a bag here and it's quite heavy and it's got some prizes and some goodies in. Does anyone have any questions in exchange for a prize? They're really good prizes. They're really good prizes. This lady here. Oh, are we going to be able to? What's been your favourite article to write? My favourite well, article. Well, what's been your favourite article to write, Jonathan? Great question. I mean, the Mark Hamill interview was really good fun to do. I liked... Hmm. Oh. No, my favourite article do, um, was uh, an interview with Stuart Freeborn. I knew you were going to say the guy that. Who, the guy who came out with Yoda, because I got to go to his house, and his, his wife, who, um, Kay, who is also a, a formidable makeup artist, she um, made me a lovely cup of tea, and um, there was, uh, they were just so lovely. It was like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, no, it was, it, was, it was just a really lovely experience, and they were both so sweet. And he was at an age where I, I was going to talk about Yoda and Star Wars, but he told me about his whole career, and I can tell you that some people, that would be phenomenally boring. But with him, it was just a delight. And, I, you know, and it was a sort of three or four hours of talking about Peter Sellers and working on the Superman films and working with the Beatles and all sorts of things like that. So that was absolutely fantastic. But I'm going to... I will... Thank you for your question. I will... Let's um, find a prize. Let me hold you, Mike. There you go. We've got two, two guys over here who have got questions as well. So Sadly, health and safety prohibits us from just flinging them into the audience. So. 
I've got a very, I've, well, I've got a helper here. He's on a wage, so um, so thank you, sir. Buddy. You can give that to the lady on the second row there. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Right, let's go for this. We'll work our way round. Yeah, we've that got time, have we? Well, we're Sorry, good, everyone. we're good. Right, we've got all afternoon. This young lady here. This is going to be on uh, Fan the Track. Like, don't, this wo is don't worry, it's already on Amazon. So. Oh, okay, fan. Yeah. Oh, is it? <laughs> okay. Um, this is going to be on Fan the Tracks, and I'm not strictly meant to say, but... Oh, the microphone cut out then. Ne next question. <laughs> Young fella here, Obi-Wan down at the front. My name? My favourite Star Wars Insider magazine to work on. Because you've done some themed ones as well, haven't you? Oh, yes. Yeah, like when Warwick edited this is that issue. This is so kind, because Mark's reminding me of all these things I've done that I can't remember. <laughs> um, so my favourite one to work on... Maybe, I don't know, have, Mark, what was your favourite issue of Star Wars Insider you've ever read? Ever read? Uh, well, uh, the, it was, we did. It, it came out when Celebration Essen was happening, so it would be 2014, I guess. Is it the Warwick Davis one? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we, yes, thank you. It's brilliant. Um, Warwick Davis kindly agreed to guest edit the magazine. So um, Warwick came into the office. Uh, he sat with us. He had tea and biscuits. Um, he was very rude about our management, which is fine. <laughs> um, and he was absolutely lovely. So I think probably the Warwick Davis um, edition, because it, you know it's nice to have a bit of star power. And I think he's probably probably Star Wars' biggest star. Sorry, Harrison Ford, but it's oh, yeah. all about Warwick. Most prolific, yeah. yeah. And just 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 for cheap plug, the next two issues of the Insider, we've got a two-part interview with Warwick, so make sure you get them. Oh, absolutely. Right. Where are we picking next? Now, this fellow here in the blue shirt has had his hands up for ages, so. Which is your favourite Star Wars oh, movie? Oh, my favourite Star Wars movie. Um, oh. Oh, my... My favourite Star Wars movie is... Battle Beyond the Stars? <laughs> Star Crash. <laughs> um, you see, the smart answer is probably The Empire Strikes Back, because I think most people would say, oh, you, you wouldn't. What's your favourite Star Wars movie? Revenge Ooh, of the Sith. Good answer. Good that answer. is a good answer. I'm going to go for A New Hope, because I think it was the first one I saw... So, and I remember just thinking the Jawas were absolutely amazing. And then C3PO said they were horrid, and I just thought, what are you thinking? Um, so, yeah, a new, a new hope. But I don't think there's been a bad Star Wars movie, to be honest. Has there? Don't look at me. Okay. No. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go with that then. Right. Milo, if you can... Well, you. whilst Jonathan's doing that, we'll pick another one. This young guy here with a hand up in the very cool... Is that a Praetorian Guard shirt? I can't quite make it out. Oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a good one. Which celebrity was the most unpleasant? <laughs> I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> um, <laughs> thing is, everyone's quite nice. You're still um, glad you came, John? No one's been really unpleasant. It, I think... Um, <laughs> oh, Mark, why did I agree to do this? Who's it? I, uh, you can be diplomatic. Okay, I... Oh, I don't know if anyone's been really unpleasant. I mean, everyone's tended to be really lovely. That's an answer. Um, oh. <laughs> I, um, can, I can feel you wringing your hands. I, 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 oh. <laughs> I'm so torn. And, no, no. Um, no, every, everyone's been really pleasant, I have to say. I mean... Um, this guy's awful, though. He's a, I mean, Man. he's just terrible. He's probably the worst Star Wars celebrity. Um, <laughs> celebrity. <laughs> oh, I have to have a think. I, may, I might come back at the end. And come back next really year when the Star Wars zone returns. I'll get him on and he can answer your question. The beans. Let's, give, let's give this guy... I don't think you deserve a prize for such a nasty question. <laughs> Any more there questions? Ah. Young man at the back with his hand up. Yes. J.W. Winter, well, he was the uh, our approvals guy for, uh, for a long time on the magazine, and um, I've yet to meet a more laid-back, lovely man. He was really fantastic. Um, and every so often, he would say, why don't you interview such and such a person? And I'd be like, well, 
you know, it, it's quite tricky to get access. He says, well, I'm playing tennis with them next week. So, you know, this is various people in the animation department or um, so on. Or he'd, he'd say things like, um, you know, oh, I'm not sure about this piece of information about Ben Burt. Um, I'll just go down the hall and ask him. So, you know, I mean, he, he's, um, he's brilliant. And his Star Wars books are absolutely Be top. He's just, done, he's just done Alien. The making, you've got it. It's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, really good. A great cover. So, uh, so yeah, I think, um, I think, yeah, no, Mr. Rinsler is fantastic. Yeah. Any more Big questions? We've, we've got another two or three minutes. So, ah, lady here. If you hadn't have done Star Wars, what franchise would you have chosen? Is that, was that the question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. probably Doctor Who. I do love Doctor Who. Or, I mean, there would never be a magazine of it. Twin Peaks, I think. <laughs> I would love to do a magazine. <laughs> I've no idea what a Twin Peaks magazine would even look like. Um, a, but a slice um, of beef. A, yeah, it would be it's sort stuck of... Stuck to the ceiling. Yeah, yeah, it'd be really weird. But yeah, I think um, uh, Doctor Who or Twin Peaks, or maybe both at once... That would be, that would be cool. That yeah. sounds good. Fellow in the corner. Um, uh, to the lady in the glasses. Have you been to Galaxy's Edge yet? Uh, no, I haven't. I've heard so much about it. It looks amazing. Um, I no, I, I, I'm. Um, yes, it's on the list. Um, we've, we've, um, me and my wife have got a recent addition to our family. So unfortunately, the idea of going to Disney just yet is uh, we're a few years off but I think Galaxy's Edge will be around for a very very long time so yeah. We've I got time for one more question and I am saying you again, you asked a good question before so I've got faith in you Is that man there now? Once That's much better, that's a much better question from this man here um, Who's my favourite character? Oh, he said who's your least favourite oh, character? No, no he didn't know <laughs> Oh, my favourite. Okay. Uh, my favourite character is... Oh, it's Luke Skywalker. He's the hero of Star Wars. Um, he's a... He, hello. Um, <laughs> he's... Uh, yeah, I think it's Luke Skywalker is my favourite. He's... I mean, um, if you look at what Mark Hamill does over the course of those movies... Um, you know, he goes from the, the whiny brat, you know, all about the power converters and Toshi Station to being, you know, a powerful Jedi and a calm, measured performance. And, oh, he, Mark Hamill's great. Yeah. He's, uh, so, yeah, Luke Skywalker. Definitely Luke Skywalker. That's brilliant. John, thanks for coming on stage. You got, you got I, well, I hate to say this. I know that we've got time, but I've got, like... If anyone does have any more questions, I have got a couple more prizes. Oh, we, we, we've got time. Come have on, we let's, got let's, time? We've got if anyone time. does. On, keep going. Come on, more questions. There's more prizes. There's a hand at the back, but you might have to project. <laughs> Who do you ship in the Star Wars universe? The Millennium Falcon. Oh, that's a terrible answer. Um, but a great oh. question. Oh no! So who who do I want to have a yes romantic uh, 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 you know, two? So I've got to fit two. Uh, Lando and L three. No. Okay. Um, let's go for. Hello. Bib Fortuna and Jabba. There you go. Not controversial at all. Ha! Right. We have. We have another the young lady just there. Hello. Who do you wish you could interview? Well, it's very sad, but I have to say Carrie, Carrie Fisher. I think right, we, I got that close as sort of to a, to, to a Carrie Fisher interview, and I, I've heard she's quite outspoken and has a lot to say, um, and so I, I'm kind of really sad we missed, we missed Carrie, but um, yeah, that would probably be... Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely right. agree. One more. We I have think. one more prize, yeah. and hence one more lady with the wonderful blue hair. Fantastic hair, isn't it? How many times have I seen each of the movies? Including Caravan of Courage. Oh, I've seen Caravan of Courage loads of times. I, I love Caravan of Courage. Um, how can the Ewoks talk in Caravan of Courage? Because that's set before. Yeah. So they should be able to talk to... They're just really trolling the rebels, that, They're totally they? playing them. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to go... Just for biscuits, that's what you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, like, I've seen them all so many times. So... 
The one I've seen the least, funnily enough, is Solo, because I think that's the most recent. recent so yeah. I haven't seen that quite so many times. But the original Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back, the original trilogy, I think I've seen like 20 or so times each, maybe more. That's not many, is it? That's not many. No, but I've watched them really carefully. I haven't been doing the ironing while I'm watching them. I've been very sort of... Uh, so do I, how many times have you watched them, Mark? Oh, wow. I stopped counting on Star Wars when it got to 150. But yeah. I was proper sad when I was a kid. And Empire obviously came out later, so there's, it's less than... It diminishes. But Solo, I've seen quite a lot because I love Solo. That's why I've got the Solo soundtrack playing in between interviews. It's, well, it's very good. No, it's no, very good. Very it's very good. good. How many prizes have we got left? Have right. we... Well, that that was our last prize. So we've got this. I oh, should I go. should say at the moment, as a plug, by the way, um, Star Wars Insider is available on, at um, titanmagazines.com. So as are all our titles. So if anyone's keen on having a bit of a read of Star Wars, I know it's very old-fashioned reading things on bits of paper, but um, <laughs> that's the way we do things at Titan. <laughs> no, that's been brilliant. I'll just Whilst I've got you here, I just want to say thank you because you took a chance on me in 2010 and it's really worked out for me. So, oh. so I really appreciate that. No so, problem. No problem. Jonathan Wilkins, thank you. No problem. Thank you. I'm Anthony Daniels and you are listening to Fanta Tracks. Well done. I'm, I'm looking to the back of the hall to my Spielberg. Mr. S- Mr. Killer, are we good? We're good. That nickname's going to stick forever. Welcome back to the Star Wars Zone, London Film at Comic Con. We're Fanta Tracks. We've been here all day. We're here tomorrow. Try the veal. We're here on stage with Alan Harris, who's done, yeah, that, that's it, it's you, who's done many, many things in Star Wars. We're going to have a good talk about that. We've got, we've got half an hour, so there's a lot to cram in. I will kick off with an obvious question that a lot of people might not know. When did you first become aware of Star Wars? I was called to Shepton Studios and got there and they put me in a long frock coat and uh, I escorted this young actress, 18 years old, didn't know who she was, uh, to meet a young actor. I didn't know who he was. Nobody knew who they were. When the bloody film came out, we knew who they were all right. Oh, wow. But it was uh, Carrie Fisher and it was Mark. And she said, just wait here. And she went off to see, speak to um, Mark for a few minutes, or a few seconds, right, about 15 seconds. And then came back to me and we started to walk down the hangar. That's the first experience with um, Star Wars. Uh, let's see. It. I think that was it on that one, really, of interest. Yeah. yeah. So when, you, when that first film came out, like a lot of people, didn't expect it to be a hit. And then you, you become involved. Did you, did you foresee the explosion in interest and popularity? No, I, I, I didn't. Um, and I think the unit were in the same boat. Uh, because they, when I was there, they would, I knew some of them, uh, the camera crew and so on. And uh, they were saying things like, um, what am I doing on this kid's picture? Because that was the attitude of them to the storyline. Uh, they didn't know at this stage, of course, what George was going to do when he got it off to, uh, back to California because he was going to do all sorts of special effects visuals with it. And they worked and uh, transformed it all. It was brilliant from what we thought, uh, we thought was, uh, was the film. Uh, it was a big surprise. It was a wonderful surprise to go to the cinema and see how it turned out because working on it you you couldn't see what it was going to be Phew, when it when you saw the film in the studio in the cinema it was a knockout and i thought well the logic is to have a sequel uh, but what are they going to do and uh george had already thought, discussed that with Al- apparently with alan ladd jr the producer who gave him that, I think it was $5 million to yeah. make it. Um, and uh, they uh, arranged for uh, to him to do three stories and three stories, uh, in theory, and uh, do them as he wished. So he thought, well, if I want to get rid of any of the actors, if they want to get too much money, uh, get a bit awkward, then I'll go treat that as the first film, then make a second one and a third one, and if there's any trouble, cut those, go back in time, do one, two, three, before those, 
uh, and get on with it. And that's how it worked out. In fact, it was a clever move. But uh, he's a clever man, and uh, he always was. You played a few characters in the film. Yeah, Explain yeah. to the audience some of the characters that you played. Uh, let's see now. We, we're coming now into Empire. Uh, before Empire, before I worked on Empire as a film, uh, a costume was made around me at the studio uh, as um, Boba Fett. It became. It was a uh, what do you call it Not now? A Mandalorian commander, Pardon? wasn't it? Like a Mandalorian commando, isn't it? Bounty hunter. Yeah, and uh, so they, they made this costume up around me uh, as a that, and uh, but they the trouble is that it was about five or six fittings and so on, um, and I uh, they they tried a, a flamethrower on me, which frightened the life out of me, but uh, <laughs> they decided that. Uh, or they were told that George, uh, no, uh, Erwin Kirshner didn't like the idea of this back, because it, it had a, uh, a gas thing in the back. I pressed my wrist, and uh, they did some fiddling behind me, and it came out as flames in my wrist, and uh, frightened the life out of me, I tell you. And uh, so that was stopped at that stage, and uh, they, they it aside uh, when they started filming they wrote in a new character used that costume uh, that became Boba Fett they changed the color of it battered it as though it'd been in battles and wars and uh, Jeremy Bullock was the actor that was for it and then uh, by that time uh, they they finished the snow shoots in I think it was Norway at that time all that snow and ice stuff and uh, they came back to the studio, started uh, filming Empire. And uh, so it, it went on and on. I was asked to stand in for Anthony Daniels for a week, five days, uh, just to ease him into it. I was an experienced stand-in. Uh, and uh, they, they'd, they'd heard that Anthony was tricky. The um, assessment of Anthony. And uh, I got on fine with him, but... Um, after the week, uh, he found out that I was being cut, uh, but he wanted me because I was too big to get in his costume. When you've got a costume with a head on it and so on, particularly, you're worried that someone else is going to nick it. Believe me, everybody is, whoever that, even when they're famous. And uh, so Anthony hit the roof, and there's nobody can hit the roof like Anthony. And uh, so, as a result, I was told I was on it for the five months with Anthony. So he was over the moon because I couldn't get in his costume and the company had me to stand in for him. So I was over the moon to have five Now, the thing about it was he wasn't working every day, so I was able to do other things, have costumes made up around me. And uh, so I was non-stop in one of the places, offices and departments having something more made up around me and it was great fun. Um, Alan we met about five or six years ago when you did your first Stoke on Trent over in Stoke yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and I got my young son with me who was very shy and you were brilliant with him you took your time to answer his questions and uh, you showed him a picture that had got Boba Fett, Han Solo in Carbonite yeah. Yeah. and you as a Bespin security guard yeah. so effectively you were playing three parts in one picture. That's right, yeah. Because you photo. were the body double for Harrison Ford for the Carbonite, I believe, the for the Frozen I one. I was, yes. I was uh, like that. It was Kurt Owen Kirshner told me to lay on the floor in a wardrobe department, which is a big area in, in front of uh, the hangers, where the costumes are hanging up. And um, he uh, said, hold that position with the fingers like that, um, whatever happens. I thought, what, whatever happens, what's going to happen? I soon found out. They put drinking straws up my nose so I could breathe, and they put plaster of Paris from my uh, head down over my body, down to my feet. Uh, I, you lose all track of time in a thing like that, uh, so I don't know quite how long it took. Anyway, got to have been 30 to minutes to an hour, and uh, the uh, result of it was that... Um, that became the carbonate body. Um, and 
they, after that, they later put Harrison in a chair. They got a small batch of uh, plaster of Paris, put it on his face, doing, ah, uh, uh, you know, dying. Um, and when that was dry, I took it off him, trimmed it, cut my face out, trimmed that, put his face on the carbonate. Practical filmmaking. It worked. People perhaps know you best as Bosk the Bounty Hunter. Yeah. What was that costume like to wear? It was okay. It was, it was no trouble at all. Uh, I went on the set without the feet on, the hands on, the head on, for the simple reason that I couldn't see. The, I looked out the nostrils, two quarter-inch holes in front of each eye. Now, if I... Sorry, my left hand's gone into cramp. Um, if I'd uh, tried to walk about uh, with, you know, with the head on, I would have... It was, uh, we were on a 10-foot rostrum, the set, so I would have fallen off the side and broken my neck or my back or something. So I used to go on the set with the feet off, hands and head, and they put them on me when I got on there. It was a doddle of a job. Doddle. It really was. Uh, yeah, very, very much a, a much loved character. I think probably because he was so colourful. We had the yellow costume and the green reptilian face and hands and legs. Well, the, the arms looked as if they were a bit longer than your normal arms. They are, they? yeah. I yeah. don't know why they were that long. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't make them, of course. No, of course there, not. Was a, <laughs> there was a number two uh, makeup girl or whatever she's called, whatever department she is. But uh, yeah, they, that was made up. For, uh, not, I, mean, I just put it on. That's all. Yeah. I didn't design or and make how, it. How long did that take to film, that scene? Well, re with rehearsals, it was probably a couple of hours. Yeah. Probably a couple of Because they're pretty, they're pretty good, you know. I mean, Dave is, you know, he knew his... Because you couldn't hear him anyway, because he's got the helmet on, uh, he's doing his mumbling. Um, the only one I could hear was uh, Ken Colley, yeah. who was next to him. And uh, I, I, I was looking down at him, and he, he, I was already curling my toes like that, my claws and uh, leaning over the set because I needed to see Ken Colley. And uh, I said, uh, when he said, uh, I don't want that scum on my ship, that was my cue to stand up right and uh, let the camera come at me and then go on to the other bounty hunters. So it was all suck it and see, you know, try it and see how it works out. They, so, were, good, they were nice people. They so nice. when you see Bosk's toes, over yeah. the side of the... Is that literally you scrunching your toes Me, up? Me, I'm, I'm doing that with my toes all, all the time, like that. I had to... In, uh, when, they, in, when they weren't fil uh, you know, filming or doing anything important, then I would be looking down all the time, doing that curling of my toes to get it right, because uh, otherwise you, you, you're no good not doing it right. It's, it, it, it's got to be right, so... That's what he wanted. That's what Kirsch, and you do your best for the Kirsch. He's the best director in the business at the time. Wonderful man, lovely. Everybody wanted to help him, believe me. He was great. It must have took you weeks to grow those nails. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, he did a lot of scenes on Bespin as well, which was beautiful sets. Mm. What was it, what, being on the sets, was the, what was the workmanship like, the craftsmanship like? Because obviously we see, that, like you mentioned earlier, you see the finished film and there's all the other elements added, but what was it like to be on that set? It was okay. I mean, it, it was, it was, there was nothing dangerous. There was nothing. It was really just go on, do your thing and, and get off. Yeah. Um, and uh, we were, we were all, well, apart from one idiot, but anyway, we all knew how to do what we were doing. I uh, won't mention his name, but anyway, uh, but uh, yes, so we, we had a, it easy, really, it, don't keep laughing, he knows what I'm talking about, so I, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, sorry, I shouldn't have said that, I won't mention any names, believe me, I'm not a backstabber, I'd like to, but I'm not. <laughs> 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 I had a question, you just made me laugh and it's completely yeah, gone. Yeah, yeah. So when, when Empire came out, obviously you had a lot in that, you had a lot invested in that, the different roles he played in, in yeah. that particular film. Yeah. What were your impressions of the final film with, with William John Williams' music, the oh, whole I finish thing? it was brilliant. I mean, we didn't know. Um, nobody was involved in that stuff with uh, Mark going down into the tunnel and that yeah, dark yeah. storyline that was written there. 
Oh, we didn't, we never knew anything about that. And to see that, that dark story was something else. Yeah. I was surprised that they went that far with the story. It was, you really did get it serious. It was serious storyline and filming and so on. And um, I respected Kirsch so much, sorry, Erwin Kirsch, yeah. uh, so much more after that. It was, you do anything for Erwin Kirsch now, believe me. Uh, he was wonderful. And um, we were lucky, we were lucky. Did, you, did that surprise you, given it was a kid's film, essentially? That they went, that, they really did go dark, didn't they? They really did, and that was him. That was Erwin Kirsch now. He was, uh, I'm not sure how long, it was either 18 months, or I think it was either a year or 18 months in preparation, yeah. doing over the script and changing the story. And cutting out what was uh, got, what was became Boba Fett, the yeah. character yeah. before, uh, in order to have Boba Fett. I mean, there were so many changes were made, uh, and I wasn't witness to any of them. I'm glad to say, but <laughs> they, there was a whole line of stuff that was happening, and it all took time. Yeah, you know, it, 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 but then once you got filming, then it speeded up because David Tomlin, the yeah. first assistant on the film. Is, was the most experienced first assistant in the world and everybody wanted him uh, to be on their films, all, uh, all companies. And uh, he finished up doing uh, a, a Rambo film. Uh, I think he directed that one. So anyway, yeah, it was, it was everybody was top notch. Uh, not me, of course. I'm just a, <laughs> a waster sort of thing. But anyway, everybody was very, very good. It's nice that you mentioned David Tomlin because yeah. Ron Hone was on here yesterday and Ron mentioned him as well. Yeah. Yeah, you know, saying what a, how he was on point, nobody yeah. messed around, everything was on time. He was, oh, he was a general, perfect. wasn't he? He was. And he appreciated... If, I mean, I used to point out things yeah. um, uh, because I was an ex-stage manager in theatre. So um, my, my job with that, with uh, being stage manager, was looking for faults before they happen. Yeah. Uh, you don't want it to happen because if, they, if you're on, if I'm on stage doing some soppy dialogue, I can't be off and get something corrected. So it, you've got to look for potential problems. And it was the same with, for David. I used to you know, mention things and uh, he was appreciative of it. So obviously you did Empire, and then you've already mentioned the Han Solo body cast for Jedi. Yeah. What did you think? Again, it's, it's an obvious question, but what did you think of Jedi when, when that ended? Because obviously you had that dark storyline that came to a, a, a happier resolution. Yeah. Did, did you enjoy that film? Obviously, visually it was it was even more of a, yeah, of a I, leap I, forward. When, when it came to Jedi, I, I was over the moon because I was called back again. <laughs> I was called in to stand in for Anthony. It was uh, like two months' work to start with, uh, and that was enough for me. I, the winter, the end of the winter, after that, the spring, then all sorts of films and TVs, they all start then. That two months was essential. Bingo. So, yeah, I was over the moon. Well, it came at the, came at the right time of year. It did, yes, it came at the right time. And uh, the funny thing is that um, it was, it, they started it in January sometime, yeah. I think, at the end of January, and there was snow and ice and I was sliding about on the roads going to, I'm living in Basingstoke, so I had a long way to drive to Elstree. And uh, so I nearly lost it on one railway bridge I drove over. Oh, dear. Anyway, there we go. <laughs> Dodgy weather is not what you want when you're going to a film studio at seven o'clock in the morning. Sort of thing. That's it. Blame the weather. <laughs> ah, right. So there's a bit of a gap, obviously, between Jedi and then Phantom Menace, which you were involved with. Explain what your involvement yeah, was with Phantom. Yeah, oh, there was many years, wasn't yeah. there? Many years. Um, yes, it, what happened is that uh, Terence Stamp was cast, obviously, as Valorum, um, and but he's standing for, oh, 30 years, um, a friend of mine, and uh, he couldn't do it because he'd had a slight mental breakdown. He'd just done two television street uh, series on the trot. Bang, and then bang again. And they knock the living donuts out of you because the hours you do are unbelievable. And uh, so he, um, 
said, look, I can't do it. And they, the company asked him who would he recommend to uh, do it. He, and he mentioned me because, first of all, he knew that I wouldn't nick his standing. Okay? I wouldn't steal it from him. It's his job, and that's it. I, I told, Terence, told Terence when I saw him. But also, uh, I, I, I took it on uh, and did it. And we got on fine. And I was actually so good for him. They had me doubling for him. They cut my hair for him and a couple of scenes uh, with a, the boy between us and, Ray, and another one. And uh, so, yes, uh, it was okay. It was okay. And you were back on the Star Wars set after all those years. How different did it feel? Were there any familiar faces? Sorry? Were there any familiar faces from when you oh, did it before? Oh, no. When you go back all those years later, there's nobody's the same. I mean, George was, of course, but... Uh, nobody else was uh, recognisable. They were all, they'd all moved on to up, up, up sort yeah. of thing, in, up in the ladder of power. And uh, George was just there as a director sort of thing. Uh, he didn't say much. He never said very much, George, um, which is fine for me. <laughs> I don't have to be talk, talk to him. Anyway, there we are. Yeah. Just going back to the, um, the first start at A New Hope, what characters did you play in Star Wars, the first film? Sorry? What characters were you in the first film, in Star Wars? The first Star Wars? Yeah. I told you, didn't I, at the beginning. The, what, who were you in, sorry? I, I was the uh, escort to Carrie Fisher under an X-Wing fighter. And then when we stood up straight, uh, she said, wait here, uh, which I did. And she walked over to see this other young American actor. So that was that was, that was Mark when you were talking about Mark and Carrie. Uh, yeah, and then sorry. Uh, yeah. she came back to me and we started to walk down the hangar. Yeah. With, that was shot at Shepparton, yeah. which is a bad studio because <laughs> uh, there's no soundproofing and there's jets flying over. But, um, there's um, it's a corrugated iron, so any sound goes through, straight through. And uh, we had this unbelievable, also any heavy traffic. You can hear the tires on the N25 going <laughs> sort of thing. And all that go in onto the <laughs> microphone and onto the... Oh, dear. I don't know how they got away with it, quite <laughs> honestly. Uh, oh, dear. So, yeah. um, did you have a favourite character that you played in the film? Bosk. 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 Yeah. That's why I'm here. Yeah. yeah. You know, the fans want to see uh, Bosk and uh, me uh, uh, for it. And uh, it's been a godsend to me. Uh, I'm so grateful that um, it's given me uh, his, it given me regular income yeah. over the years. I've done so many. I used to do one-day shows, uh, and then it got to two-day shows, and now I'm here for a three-day show, <laughs> uh, providing I survive tonight. And uh, <laughs> steady, do you Alan. Know why steady. I say that? <laughs> I've had lung cancer diagnosed, mm. and I had it treated last October and uh, it's that's gone that actual piece of lung cancer has gone excellent news Unfor unfortunately they found a shadow on the inside of the lung I don't know how how big it is it looks like it's about two inches square and what happens in that case is that I breathe air in through there and into my lung and it disappears out of this blinking uh, shadow. So I, get, I finish up with half the air that went into the lung in the, staying in the lung. So we walked here very slowly wherever yeah, he is. Oh, there he is over there. I have to walk everywhere very slowly. I don't like walking upstairs because I have to keep stopping, etc. So, but I'm a survivor. I'm 81 years old and I've beaten it. Good man, good man. We're, we're at the end of our talk, but I am going to open the floor to just one question. If anybody's got a question for Alan, it would be very cool if you put your hand up now. There you go, go for it, sir. Hello, Alan. Hello. <laughs> Again. Again. <laughs> Hello from Dublin. Where's the um, finish? We'll organise that for you. <laughs> I asked you the same question earlier. All the people that you worked with on these amazing films, it was there one person that stood out for you in your memory more than anybody else? One person that was made that impression that you thought was an incredible person, 
incredible to work with. It's one Irving, person. Erwin Kirshner. Erwin Kirshner, yeah. Best director incredible, yeah. you could possibly have. Erwin yeah. Kirshner was the best yeah. director you could possibly have. Yeah. We were lucky that Jules did, because he was a lecturer at uh, one of the universities in yeah. uh, California, and uh, he'd, I think he'd been lecturing George, so they knew each other. They all, they all that gang, they all knew each other. And so uh, when it came to, they asked him, and then he mo yeah. modified the script to make it a great film, and uh, yeah. he was perfect. He was, you yeah, couldn't well, be you, you contributed to that film immensely. I yeah. mean, for a lot of fans, a lot of fans feel that The Empire Strikes Back is perhaps the greatest Star Wars film ever made. And if you could hang it on the wall as a piece of art, it's a, it's a, it's a masterpiece, it really is. And the contribution you made yeah. to that film is yeah. incredible. And we'd like to thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Let's hear it for him. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for that. That's the end of our talks for today, but let's have a big round of applause for Alan Harris. Thank you. That's all for this special episode of Making Tracks. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Android, Spotify, SoundCloud, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spreaker. If you want to find Fanta Tracks out there in the wild, you can find us on smart speakers such as Amazon, Alexa, Apple HomePod, Google Home, and Sonos. We're also available in the car with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, on gaming consoles and television. You can find us on Fanta Tracks TV, on YouTube, or the Fanta Tracks app. And of course, you can drop onto the dedicated landing page for Fanta Tracks Radio on fantatracks.com. We'll be back very soon, but for now, cheers, guys.